Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Lyme disease. Most people know that it's condition caused by ticks. You understand that people get a bull's eye lesion at the site of the bite. To be at risk, you have to live on the east coast of the U.S. and you have to go trekking through the woods in order to be exposed. Well, two out of three isn't bad, but it could be an extremely serious shortfall in your understanding of the spreading ailment. And what does this condition look like in pets? Are dogs and cats both at risk? To clear up some misconceptions and enlighten us on new research is Dr. Craig Pryor, the immediate past president of the Companion Animal Parasite Council, an organization whose information I use on almost a daily basis in practice. We're going to be right back after this short break. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Dynavite for life. Pick up two tubes of Doggo Suds. Get the third tube free. Peppermint, tea tree, lavender, Doggo Sud shampoo. Made with all-natural coconut, jojoba, aloe. Great for healthy skin and soft, shiny coats. But no itchy, harsh chemicals. Lather up, rinse away. Try Doggo Suds. Buy two, get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Dr. Pryor, thank you so much for being with us. I love reading my guest bios. And I have to ask you, it says that in 1982, you represented Australia in the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. What were you doing? Well, I um, I was at university at the time. I was in, actually in vet school, and I felt like I needed a uh, gap year just to get an attitude adjustment. So we were allowed to, you know, take a gap year. And I was uh, applied for a job. I wanted to travel. I applied for a job, and I was one of 24 people chosen uh, Australia wide to represent Australia. There had nothing to do with veterinary medicine. Had everything to do with just um, talking to people about Australia, about what such a wonderful country it was. And back in 1982, very few Americans really knew much about Australia. So so we were our exhibit at the World's Fair was all about Australia. And we were there just to talk to people and encourage them to go visit. And uh, people have been visiting ever since and they love it. So that's a good thing for Australia. See, you did such an awesome job that everyone yes. is going. <laughs> Thank you for the enlightenment. Very good. So number one, we're talking about Lyme disease. But I think before we get into that, I'm not sure people really understand how dangerous ticks can be to their health and to their pet's health. They think, oh, they're just these little bugs that are crawling around, kind of like fleas. Please, tell us how wrong we are in that thinking. Incredibly wrong. So, you know, ticks are really, really ugly. Oh, yes. Uh, nasty little creatures. And we go, yuck, I don't want, like them on me, I don't like them on the, my pets. It's not so much the ticks, it's what they pass on to us and our pets. So, they are actually called vectors, and a vector is an organism or an animal or whatever. It's something that actually transmits something to something else. So they're actually a vector. And so they transmit many different diseases. They, they, they can transmit them to diseases to different animals or humans. A few of them can be Lyme disease, alechia, anaplasma, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, there's other things that occur that you hear about tularemia, uh, the biziosis, spotted fever, human granulocytic anaplasmosis, Colorado tick fever, tick-borne encephalitis. I mean, I can just go on and on and on. Powassan virus is just showing up as being a new pathogen recently. So it's just they've got all kinds of nasties that they carry, and they have the potential to transmit to us and some of them, uh, and, and also to our pets. And that's what we need to be worried about. So we got to kill them before they transmit disease. That's the bottom line. Mm. 
so many, many diseases. So it's not just, oh, this ugly thing that's on the pet. I think one of a lot of people, you know, yes, some people do live on the East Coast and they hear about it more there. But I'm a Southern California kid and I'm not in a gated community, but I know many of my clients that come to my practice, you know, live in very manicured areas. And when I tell them about ticks, they kind of look at me like, really? <laughs> I have this little fuzzy white dog whose paws are always fuzzy white. And there is no way that my dog is ever going to have a tick on it. So how can suburban animals still have exposure? And I guess I should ask, what kind of animals? Where do they need to be in order to get exposed? Well, they can really just be anywhere. A lot of it is knowing, I think we should maybe digress here into the life cycle of the tick so people can understand what's involved. So the major ticks that we have in the United States, so there's four, you can actually say five major ticks, and there's a new one that's actually spreading into the U.S. as well. But you've got the black-legged tick or the deer tick. You've got the brown dog tick, the American dog tick, and you've also got the lone star tick. Uh, you can add to that maybe the Gulf star tick that's just more or less on the you know, Texas, the Gulf area. But it can be considered a major tick as well, so that's number five. Then you've got the new tick that's invading the U.S., and we probably need to talk about that separately, but it's the East Asian longhorn tick. And it's a one nasty little tick. But the other ticks I was talking about, and we'll use the black-legged tick as the, the deer tick as the main example because we're talking about Lyme disease. It has a three-host life cycle. That means it's on three different hosts during its life. The life cycle of this tick is that the adult tick, it seeks a blood meal. So it, what we call it questing. It climbs up on the grass or bushes, and it's waiting for an, a host to walk by, and it grabs onto it climbs onto it, climbs up, typically on the back, on the neck, on the ear areas, head area. And it likes the adult tick and likes to feed on the deer. And so it has a blood meal. And then the female will drop off and can lay anywhere from two to 8,000 eggs in the environment. So these eggs will then hatch out into larva. And they actually like to feed on the white-tailed mice. And then it will they'll drop off and become the nymph stage, which will then feed on a different host. And it may be a bird. It could be a reptile. It could be another animal. could be your pet. And then it will have a blood meal drop off. And then it will become eventually become the adult. And the life cycle is then repeated. The thing is, the tick, the one tick can live over four years. And it spends an average of over three years in the environment. So most people that have an animal that has like, like a dog, Lyme disease have never seen a tick on the dog. A lot of them do, but a lot of them don't because by the time they develop Lyme disease, the tick's long gone. In fact, only about 30% of dog owners that have actually reported tick-borne disease in their pets ever report having seen a tick on their pet. So you need to remember that, that the, you know, just because you don't see a tick doesn't mean your dog didn't get a tick and it's spread disease and now it's gone. The other thing is, is that it lives on wildlife. So the ticks love to feed on wildlife. So we've got the deer. And deer are very adapt to living. So, you know, one of the biggest reasons we see the spread of Lyme throughout the United States is because of the spread of deer. And in the early 1900s, late 1800s, the U.S. Pop deer population was down, down to less than 500,000. That's why we really didn't have Lyme disease in the 18th, 19th century is a problem. The deer population now is well in the hundreds of millions. And deer has learned to live in very close association to civilization, to man. They live in the suburbs. They live in the cities. You'd be amazed where they live. I live in Southern California in the area that I live. There's deer crossing signs and periodically, not all that commonly, we will see them, you know, munching on our foliage you know, okay. here in you know, suburbia. They love munching on foliage in, in suburbia and they're happy to, to jump over gated fences. Not in gated communities, fences in gated communities. Plus, you've got the another uh, the life stage, the the, the white-tailed mice, which is they're everywhere. They spread. They're really, really adapt living around civilization people as well. And then another host is birds. And so you could have a cat that hangs out on the on the balcony of an 11th story condo, downtown condo, and um, you have birds show up, and the birds can drop. You know, the, the owner may have a bird feeder on their balcony to, to amuse the cat. Well, the birds show up to feed. The birds have ticks on them that will drop off and they can get on the cat that lives on the 11th floor of a high rise. That is absolutely scary, Dr. Pryor. <laughs> there was actually, uh, let's digress a little bit here, but there was actually a case where there was two cats that lived on a, something like the 10th floor of a high rise in Chicago a couple of years ago. 
that um, found that were allowed out on the balcony that found a, a bat and was playing with it. The bat died, and the owners came home, found the dead bat. They had it said it was positive for rabies. Their cats, and the owner did not vaccinate his pet, the cats, because they thought they weren't at risk. And it just goes to show you that they can be at risk. And same with ticks on the inner high rise as well. So, and it's not just the mice and not just the deer. There are many other animals that, you know, the, the ticks can be fairly non-selective feeders. I mean, they will feed on any mammal, any bird, any, you know, most amphibians, um, even reptiles. They're happy to feed on something that's a blood meal. You were talking about feeding. And I remember in veterinary school, and it's one of the reasons I think why I disliked parasitology is remembering, okay, this particular species of ticks likes to eat on white tail mice and it's going to be this particular life stage. It's like, oh, really? Just give me the flea that's on the pet. That's a lot easier. But you're talking about feeding. And one of the things I was always told, because I tell my clients, you know, when you're back from taking your dog for a walk or your cat's been outside, I have to remind them, or even inside, is checking them for ticks. And you really want to get it off within a fairly short amount of time because the longer it feeds, the greater the chance of it spreading the disease that the organisms that right. it has. Talk a little bit about how the adult tick actually feeds. So the adult tick has a, it's actually a really, really complicated, it's got this long proboscis that it basically sticks in. It's got these little, it's hard, it's hard to describe it, but it's got these little other little things that stick out that anchor it. It puts out the cementum so that actually it adheres in there, then pushes out anticoagulants so that the blood doesn't clot. And then it sucks blood in and then expels the blood out and sucks the blood in and then starts filter filtering it to get what it needs out of it. It's an incredibly complicated, it's amazing the way it does it. And it's in this feeding that the bacteria that causes you know, Lyme disease is transmitted. And it, with Lyme disease, it can take 12 to 24 hours. I actually think that in some cases it may take less time than that. So the tick has to be actively feeding and actively attached for 12 to 24 hours to transmit Lyme. But I actually think that that time may now be less. There's actually I've seen some discussions where it may be even as little as eight hours. And so, you know, the tick has to be attached for that period of time and feeding. So that's why we want to get the tick off straight away. And a plasma can be as little as about six to eight hours. And a leukiosis as little as four hours attachment before it starts to transmit. It just reinforces get the tick off as soon as you can. And speaking of getting the tick off, so many times people have come in saying, oh, it was a week ago that my dog was bitten by a tick. I removed it with my fingers, number one. And number two, I know that the head is still embedded in the pet because it has this bump. Dispel those misconceptions, please. All right. So, you know, removing a tick, use a pair of tweezers, preferably get as close to the skin as you can, grasp it and pull it out. The head is actually part of that. You know, when you look at the tick, it's got this like big body on it. The head is actually part of that big body. What is some people, when they don't pull it out properly, sometimes just leaves part of the mouthpieces in there. But what's happening is the skin, the animal's having a reaction to the whatever's left in there. And that's what's causing that big bump. It's not a head that's in there. And even if you do get the mouth part out, you've still got some what we call antigen from the tick there that that's creating a reaction in the pet. And so that's why you get a bump there. And you typically don't get the target lesion that humans get. So humans very characteristically get a target lesion, a red ring around the bite. You don't get that with, with dogs. And cats, you know, just briefly touch on cats. Borrelia, which is Lyme, Borrelia uh, uh, bedolfii, it does infect cats, but there's not enough known about it. And we don't know that it, we don't, you know, they don't really know about the disease manifestations in cats. So even though it does affect cats, we're not sure how it affects cats. There's a lot of research still being done on that. One of the things to kind of get back to that bite, and thank you for telling the listeners that, you know, it's not that they're leaving the head parts behind. The reason I totally agree with you, you want to use tweezers or mosquito forceps or needle nose pliers or something, you don't want to use your own fingers because if you were to have a cut in your finger, you can get exposed to that 
tick blood. And if it was an infected tick, you can get an infection. So, you know, you always want to be so careful. It's like if you're bitten by a mosquito, you're going to have a bump afterwards just because of that reaction. So your pet is going to have that bump or you're going to have a bump. And I think I've been bitten by a tick a couple of times. And you always know when you're being bitten by a flea because, ow, it hurts. Right. But Ticks are sneaky little devils. You well, don't well, actually, feel them. They have to actually inject the, the local anesthetic as part of, you know, attaching. So you don't feel it. Mm. Christ, they're quite remarkable little critters. Well, I'm chatting right now with Dr. Craig Pryor, the past, immediate past president, the Companion Animal Parasite Council. We'll be right back after the short break to talk more about nasty little ticks and Lyme disease. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. Molly, here's your dinner. (laughs) Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. Dr. Pryor, ticks, I just think, are amazing creatures, how they've adapted to so many different animals and different parts of not just the United States, the world. In the introduction, I was saying that, okay, most people think that you have to live on the East Coast to be exposed to ticks. Is that true? Or be exposed to Lyme disease? Is that true? No, that's incorrect. So Lyme disease is spreading, spreading north into Canada, spreading. So it's if you look at the actual, if you go to the Companion Animal Parasite Council, we have a website called capcvet.org. It's C-A-P-C-V-E-T. Dot org. It'll sh- and we have a maps section. You can go to the maps and you can actually look at where the we keep track of where all the infections are in dogs and uh, by state and by county. And you can see that the main concentration of Lyme is in the northeast, but there's also the, another concentration in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Exodes pacificus, which is the deer tick of the north. West is what transmits it up there. But we're also seeing that Lyme is slowly spreading and it's spreading down through Kentucky, Tennessee, and it's slowly working its way further into the US. And the other thing we're finding is that areas that are considered endemic for Lyme, we're getting a denser infection rate there. So the number of cases, the prevalence rate is going up markedly. Is the infection rate in pets? the same as it is in humans? So interestingly enough, back in 2012, the CDC did an analysis and they published a paper that said that that if there is an infection rate of 5% or more in your county in dogs, dogs are a sentinel for the risk of human infection. The Companion Animal Parasite Council is in the process of publishing paper that says that any percentage infection in dogs Dogs in your county, dogs are a sentinel for the risk of human infection at the same percentage rate. So if mm. you live in Pennsylvania and you, if you look at the capcvet.org maps and it says in your county that there's an 18% prevalence rate in dogs, you are at 18% risk of developing Lyme in that, if you live in that county. If you're in Tennessee and you're in like Nashville, we've got a prevalence rate of, of 1.2% or something like that, then then, the, then I'm at risk of, of about 1.2% of developing Lyme. The, the infection rate in dogs is a sentinel for the risk of infection rate in humans, and that's what we're publishing now. And I think people are also under the misconception that this is really a very seasonal disease. You, know, you only have to worry about ticks probably late spring, summer, and then they kind of go away. You don't have to worry about them. 
So let's just spell a few of those myths. So I, I told you about the, the life cycle of the tick, the three host life cycle, mm-hmm. all different hosts it lives on. If you map all the different ticks and their different life stages, so I mentioned five different species of ticks and the three different life stages for each of those ticks. So we're up to 15 different life stages that I'm talking about. And you map when they eat, when they feed. Ticks tend to have different life stages like to feed different times of the year. And so you can have peak feeding times like adult deer, uh, black-legged ticks. Uh, They may, you know, they they, uh, tend to peak feed, you know, late fall, something like that. But there is, ticks don't feed 365 days of the year. But there is a life stage of a tick. Ticks will feed 12 months of the year. There's always a tick life stage looking for a feed. And a lot of people say, well, listen, you know, it's two feet of snow outside my window. How can ticks survive? Ticks incredibly hardy. Ticks will actually sit below the top level of snow. Snow will act like an inch later. And if the temperature hits 43 degrees, they're active and they're questing. They're looking for a meal. And so that's your magic figure. Look at the temperature outside. If it's 43 degrees or higher, ticks are active. You know, you're really making my skin crawl. (laughs) (laughs) So speaking of crawling, they are very good, as you're mentioning, questing. And when your pet comes in, you know, people kind of give them a a quick once over. And I think a lot of people don't know. I know a lot of people don't know what a tick looks like. One of my neighbors called me and said, can you come over? I I think Lemmy, you know, my dog has a tick. I said, well, all right. Or people will come in going, well, my dog had a tick. I pulled it off and now the area is bleeding going, well, did it have legs? I don't know. I didn't look. So please explain the different sizes of a tick, what it looks like, yes. and where will you find it on a body? And you know, what are the, the okay. giveaways that it's a tick and not a skin tag? Yeah, so there's three life stages. There's the, the larval stage, and it actually looks like, they call them seed ticks, but it actually looks like the top of a pinhead. There's mm. that small. But they tend to, you tend to often get hundreds of those at a time on a pet. You've got the nymph stage and the adult stage tend to be bigger. The adult is the largest stage and they tend to be, you know, they're almost like teardropped with eight or six legs hanging off them. So the adult has eight legs. The larva stage has six legs. The nymph has eight, I believe. So you've got to look for the legs that move and a, and an engorged tick is huge. It can, it can actually look, um, oh, you know, probably I'm used to centimeters. So, you know, half to one centimeter in, in diameter. That would be one centimeter is probably about a third of an inch. So they can actually get quite big. The deer tick, the the black-legged tick, those ticks tend to like to be on the dorsum, the top of the animal. So the back, the shoulders, the neck, the head, the ears. The lone star tick, which tends to be more a southern tick and more current in California as well, tends to be a ventral tick. It likes the axillary areas, which is under the front legs. It likes the, the belly but inside of the thighs between the feet. So different ticks have different different areas that like to, to go. And it's important that, um, you know, we go hiking, we go out, the, kid, the kids go up play in the park or whatever, and kids come home every day. And, you know, if you're in a known tick area, we always do a tick check on our kids. We should always do tick checks on our pets at once a day as well because we tend to ignore that because we think, well, they may, you know, they're on a preventive, they should be okay. No, we should still be doing a tick check on them because no preventive is 100% effective 100% of the time. And we need to get those ticks off. And get them off quickly, as you were saying. Correct. So since we're talking about Lyme disease and you mentioned, no, not everybody is going to have, people-wise, is not going to have that bullseye lesion. I know I was just talking to one of my colleagues at the practice and said, oh, yes, it was some friend of the family, a young girl who has been having these really strange, debilitating signs. And they've done this huge workup and they're looking for various diseases. And oh, they just couldn't find it, just couldn't find it. And finally, one of the doctors said, let's look for Lyme disease. And here it is again, Southern California. And it came up, this poor sweetie has Lyme disease, had been exposed to a tick, who knows where. Um, They never knew of a tick bite, but she was having these diseases that's going to follow her the rest of her life. What can we expect to see in the dog? A lot of the dogs exposed, most dogs exposed to, to Lyme appear to develop subclinical signs. But acute Lyme infection you tend to find they get fever, shifting leg lameness, swollen joints, enlarged lymph nodes, uh, lethargy, depression, 
anorexia, which means loss of appetite. And so that's the huge signs. Dogs with chronic Lyme disease will often have a shifting leg lameness. They get a persistent polyarthritis, which is you know, joint inflammation and then joint changes. And then they may even end up with um, kidney disease, chronic kidney failure. So about 40, uh, they've got latest statistics are over 40% of dogs that have Lyme disease develop chronic kidney disease as well. That's pretty debilitating. And that'll start off the signs with that. It'll be a dog that starts urinating a lot, drinking a lot. That's the early signs. For all the signs that you're mentioning, you know, G-Doc is just off. Just seems, I don't know, just something doesn't seem right. Ain't doing right, Doc. And then, okay, we're just going to watch it a little bit longer. Oh, well, it doesn't seem to be bothering it that much. Oh, let's just give it a little bit more time. And then by the time you bring it in, it says, yeah, everything is fine. I don't need to work it up. Why take it in? And then I think people can get so frustrated when we want to do blood work. We want to take x-rays or it's just old doc and that's why it's not moving around well. I think it's so necessary for them to realize, yes, sometimes we want to do a tick panel to run these diseases because there's that possibility correct and just because your pet's old doesn't mean it has to act old it's often it's acting old because it's got something that's underlying that just hasn't been diagnosed yet and you know you may have just been traveling with your pet and you know you're in southern california and yes you got ticks there but you may have just flown up to the northeast somewhere to go visit a relative and 40% 40% of people now travel with their pets, taking their pet, taking your pet with you, visit grandma or whatever, come back home. A month later, your dog's just acting just a little odd. And there you go. That's why we run tick panels on them. And they're not an expensive panel to run. And they t- give us a lot of information. And the earlier you get on top of these, the better it is for that pet as far as recovery goes. Dr. Pryor, what is the treatment? What can you do? It sounds like, oh, this is a nasty disease. So if it's a nasty disease, it's going to be really expensive to treat in those early stages. Right, and it's really not. It's um, We treat with doxycycline, and it's a daily dose of doxycycline for 30 days. Which is just um, an antibiotic. It's an antibiotic, yes. And it's in most cases, it's, it's um, very effective on clearing it up. In the chronic cases, it can be hard harder um, but in the acute cases it's typically very effective and so it's a very cost effective way of treating as well so that's very important so uh, you know it's, it's all about det- you know, early detection and early treatment well i think treatment early is extremely important but i think preventing it all together as you're saying here this is condition disease that can be spread to your pet 365 days a year so what's the best way to protect the pet. Yes, take a look at it every day, pull off any ticks that you see ASAP, but what else can you do to protect your pet? I think there's, really, I think you should look at a three-pronged approach. So detect, prevent, and protect. So protect would be using Lyme vaccine. Okay. And uh, Lyme vaccines now are very, very effective. And so I think that any dog that's in an area that, uh, you know, so I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and Tennessee is not a huge Lyme area but it's moving down into this area. I'm not going to wait till my dog is at high risk to develop Lyme to protect my dog. I have started protecting my dog now. So that's the, that, that's the protect. And then prevent. Prevent is by using a carocides, things that will kill ticks. And the products we have now, a lot of them are very good at killing fleas and ticks together, and some of them even do fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. So, you know, it's a matter of using appropriate products appropriately and the Companion Animal Parasite Council recommends year-round tick prevention because it is a 12-month-of-the-year disease. What can people do to protect themselves? I know you're a veterinarian, and we're not supposed to give human <laughs> advice, but medical advice. But how can people prevent themselves from being exposed? So preventing yourself from being exposed, it can be very difficult. But let's talk about a couple of situations. You have a, a yard that you worry about having ticks in your yard that could get onto you, get on your children. Keep your grass cut short. Ticks don't. Well, ticks tend to like longer grass, bushes, things like that. And if you're in an area where you may back up to woods, which is uh, a great habitat for deer, then I would put a three-foot strip of mulch between your yard and the woods. Hmm, it's that's easy. Very unattractive for ticks to cross. If you do start finding ticks in your yard because you got a lot, a lot of wildlife coming through your yard, and therefore they're dropping it, dropping down there. 
uh, ticks down there. You can pick up products at Lowe's, Home Depot, some of the big box stores that you can actually put on your yard that will kill uh, ticks and fleas and other bugs as well. And so that's going to be helpful as well. If you do a lot of hiking, then you should be using products on yourself. So you can use like DEET on yourself. You can actually also get permethrin products that you can spray on your clothing. You can actually buy clothing now that's actually impregnated with permethrin, uh, very effective for carousel. And so use those type of products, but you should always be doing tick checks on yourself as well. And just to give you some idea, you know, when you're out, especially people that go hiking or camping or things like that in the woods, I've actually been out tick dragging with a parasitologist and we were tick dragging. Boy, that sounds like fun. Oh, it was a, it was a hoot. (laughs) (laughs) Trust trust me, I needed alcohol after that day. Um, (laughs) It was interesting because we went out and we actually found an area where deer had bedded down. It was a wooded area. It wasn't a heavily wooded area, but it was a mildly wooded area. Lots of long grass, bushes. You could see where the deer had bedded down. And so we tick dragged in that area. There was probably in an area that was probably 15 feet by 15 feet. There was probably, oh, you could estimate about a couple thousand ticks. And tick dragging is not dressing up like a tick in drag it's taking a cloth and pulling it correct 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 and picking ticks up and ticks are questing they grab onto the onto the on the cloth as it goes by thinking it's an animal and so you can actually see and you know you can actually lift a leaf up and find where the ticks are you got what show where the ticks are you lift the leaf over and i've seen you know leaf with a couple hundred ticks on the back of it just waiting for an animal to walk by trying to get onto it i Um, really do need to shower about now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so We could keep talking, I can tell, and yes, my skin is crawling and I need to get a friend to do a tick check on me, it feels like now. What are some websites that my listeners can go to to learn more about these disgusting little creatures? So let me give you, I think, one of the great websites to go to straight off the bat, PetDiseaseAlerts.com. That's our latest website, CAPSI, the Companion Animal Parasite Council. We've just put that up live about a month ago. We are actually forecasting on a national basis the uh, prevalence of Lyme, Ehrlichia, and Anaplasma, and Heartworm. We've been doing this now for about five years. Our forecasts are 92 to 98% accurate. Now, the weatherman's only about 70% accurate. Would you like a forecast that really shows you what the risk is? We are now forecasting one month in advance on the local level for your county. So if you go to Pet Disease Alerts, you can click on Lyme, you can click on your state, then click on your county, and you can see... So right now, so uh, when you hear my voice, it'll be February. You'll be able to look at what March's forecast is in your county for Lyme disease, anaplasma, alikia, and heartworms. You can see what the risk is. It'll show you what the historic risk is, and it'll show you what the one month in advance what the risk is. And it's just a great way, especially if you're traveling, you're going somewhere with your pets, you want to know what the risk is for your pets. You're traveling, you want to go somewhere, maybe you're going somewhere to go hiking or whatever, or camping, you can see what the risk is for you as well for Lyme disease. Because if it um, affects your pet, it affects you. Um, what so a great service. PetDiseaseAlerts.com. If you want a lot of detailed information, CapsiVet.org is our main website. And then we've got the consumer website, uh, which is a little simpler for people to understand. And it's Pets and Parasites. Dot org is that website. Sounds like some great reading tonight when people have nothing to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I've had the great pleasure of speaking to Dr. Craig Pryor, the immediate past president of Companion Animal Parasite Council. Dr. Pryor, thank you very much. Even though I'm now crawling and want to take a shower, some very good information. So again, thank you for spending your time with us today. My pleasure. Well, this is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Thank you so much for listening. Please tune in again next week. We'll give you some more information on how to make you that best possible and healthy pet owner. Take care. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.